Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Peter Ashley broadcasting live from the IATL. Today we've got Brian Mulligan with us and we've got a slightly different session today, which is um, connected vehicles, the practice versus the theory. Um, and we always like to talk about this. So I want to welcome uh, Brian Mulligan for joining us today. Thank you for your time, Brian. Thanks, Pete. And uh, do you want to just explain what we're going to be doing today? Yes, I think I'll, I'll sketch out the, 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 the basis like this, is that uh, we're in the technology business. And so often we get so focused on the technology of how connected vehicles work, that we forget about well, what's it supposed to do. And uh, any number of uh, studies and you know, repeated um, truths or, well, we're going to save 80% of the accidents and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Um, and then we go from there into an argument about the radios. And so there's uh, all sorts of discussion about the different kinds of radios, the current radios, the future radios, the FCC's position, what states and uh, cities should be doing. And so what I'm proposing to do is to change the subject completely away from that whole discussion about radios, I'm going to reference them from time to time, the whole, but actually focus on the application. What does all of this do for Joe Public? And how's all this going to roll out in practice? So what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion about it. Then we're going to walk around the IATL here and look at the, some of the complexities you uh, uncover on the real roadways. Uh, and then how we set about uh, mitigating those, those risks. And then let's go and drive around Alpharetta and see some of this in action. So we'll demonstrate a bunch of applications and we're going to show you a bunch of radios, but we're going to get away from that you should choose this radio versus that radio. We're going to focus on the application and what this does for the public. Perfect. Thanks so much for, for that introduction. And I believe we're even going to stop off at one of the traffic cabinets and look inside of that. Seeing is believing. And so the two kinds of facts in the technology business, I like to say, facts you've been told and facts that you've seen. The ones you've seen are worth a lot more than the ones you've been told because, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do with, uh, with the magics of cinematography, you know, with, of, of, of sales puffery is the technical term. But what we're going to do is actually look at some intersections, see how priority and preemption are actually done in the cabinet then look at the radios and see how they mounted and see uh, where this is going with future proofing the radios where you can add radios in the future as this environment changes. Perfect, thanks. Now, Jessica, do you have some, any guidelines for us um, as before we kick off and start talking about some more things? Yeah, so we have the Q&A box as always available in the Zoom controls down at the bottom. And um, if you want to just type in there, if we have time at the end, we will go over those. Um, and I had some people ask at the last one. So these are going to be recorded um, and available on our YouTube channel and our training channel afterwards. So if you can't stay for the whole thing, we hope that you can because it's going to be super cool. Um, it will be available for viewing at a later time. Perfect. Thank you, Jessica. So if you guys just make sure to chat your questions out there. Jessica will pipe in and, and, and ask the questions while we're busy doing the, the, whole, the whole session. So, um, and one of the things that maybe I could ask you to do as far as questions is, uh, yeah, as I said, this is going to focus on applications. I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about radios. Uh, but if there's any confusion about the, about the radios or the FCC or where we're up to in the, the, what's called the NPRM process, Please type those questions and maybe we can do another masterclass in what we're doing, what the FCC is doing, what the radios are doing, and we can deal with that as a separate uh, discussion for those folks who are interested in the radios, who are interested in what the different states are doing. I'm more than happy to address them. But I'd like to build on the technology in support of what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. not start off with the technology and say, we've got all this cool stuff. Oh, I wonder what we can do with it. No, that's not the idea. We're going to start off with what it does and, and, and the application side of it and then move to the radio. So uh, let, let us know what, what you want more detail on the technology as well. 
I'm going to stand up and go grab uh, the mobile camera because I think that's where you want to go. Yep. Let's go. Um, let's go and have a walk around and uh, and have a look at um, how how we do all of this in practice. All right, Brian. All right, here we go. So uh, for those of you who haven't seen the IATL before, this is a infrastructure automotive, infrastructure automotive technology laboratory. It's got all kinds of traffic equipment that uh, is used in the United States. And so this first I'll be looking down is all different kinds of traffic controllers from different manufacturers. And all these traffic controllers send out the signal phase and timing message, which is what the traffic controller is doing, and most importantly, what it's going to be doing. And so this is the, one of the cornerstones of the um, connected vehicles, is getting that information into the cars with radios. But all of these traffic controllers, they all walk, work slightly differently. And as we drive around, we might see some of that complexity uh, in play. And so, for example, is it sending the right timers? We've moved beyond the business about does the radio transmit from A to B? Yes, all the radios work. Do the messages work? Yes, they do. Now, what is the quality of the data and the information like? We're going to go and have a look at some of that as, as we drive around. These are a, a couple of uh, traffic cabinets, NEMA cabinet, a Caltrans cabinet, uh, the kind of cabinets you see we put equipment in. Uh, in, in all these cabinets uh, to do the uh, preemption and the transit signal priority and some of the other monitoring and processing um, and have some of the radios. Uh, in total, we're considering that connected vehicles are going to have potentially six different kinds of radios that one sort of has to be prepared for. Now, everybody's been arguing about this radio versus this radio. We, we don't do that. We say, Let's be ready for whatever radios there are, and then we'll be successful in connected vehicles because the radio selection is going to be done by, first of all, the automobile industry. There's some uh, dynamics on the move there with the, with the new Automotive uh, Innovation Association and their approach to dealing with the, uh, with the different radios, uh, plus the FCC and so forth. So, we're standing by to, be, to accommodate uh, a bunch of different radios. What you see on the wall behind me is all sorts of uh, traffic equipment, which is not traditionally dealt with in terms of connected vehicles. There's school beacons, slow down zones, which are high accident roads. We've got railroad crossings. We've got uh, road flooding. We've got unprotected left turn technology. We've got... Uh, pedestrian crossings. An interesting thing about all these devices that I've spoken about, they all need to be part of this connected vehicle landscape. And so the business of putting radios on these devices is comparatively simple. Um, that's, you know, choose one or the other or all of the radios. And uh, these all work, uh, can put out connected vehicle messages. These all, interestingly enough, work on what's called TIM messages, the information messages, where you're sending out the status of the roadway infrastructure, uh, as well as reduced speed limits and so forth, as a traveler information message. And we've worked um, uh, very hard with NEMA as a standards organization to write a, a new standard about how all these messages work. That's NEMA PS10. We've got something interesting here, which... Uh, yeah, the, the folks who, who yeah, we come on the side, um, uh, you yeah, see we've got a traffic signal here. But what we have here is a poster on the wall of all the kinds of traffic lights that are permitted by MUTCD. So as you're going around and testing, what you have to do is figure out that does your software in your car which is what the automakers are working on, does that actually accommodate all these different kinds of traffic lights? And as we drive around Alpharetta here, you'll see how many different types of traffic lights there are. In fact, in a comparatively small space. 
And so this is where the, um, where we, the practice comes in, is that we've got to get all this expertise and all this um, institutional knowledge into the automobile. And that's the next stage that's beyond the radio. So that's what we're going to sh show today. And what we're going to do is, uh, in fact, maybe what we'll do is just have a run across this, uh, this functional art on our way out from the car. And this shows, for example, this, uh, this little piece of functional art on the wall here, is all the different kinds of radios that are uh, being contemplated and have been in use. And so this is 2G cellular, 3G Wi-Fi radios, uh, 4G LTE, cellular V2X line of sight, or what they're now call calling cellular V2X direct, and DSRC. Both of these have got iterations that in the planning uh, phase of DSRC advanced and as well as um, 5G NR as the line of sight radio, and then the future of 5G. And so what we have to do is when we're figuring out the radios, and this is a topic for, for a separate uh, presentation, is how to figure out the radios and how to build radio devices that accommodate the future. And that's what we've done with, uh, with our products, how we see, see the world. But that's not, not what we focused on today. What we focused on today is what does it do for the public and how do we make all this work? So Pete, let's, uh, let's head out to the car. And <clears throat> Brian, while we're walking out to the car, uh, what are some of the kinds of things people can expect to see when we're driving around? So what we're going to do is we're going to see, um, thanks Walt. Um, we're going to see applications uh, of the car connected to the traffic lights. And so we're going to see, first of all, what we call signal phase and timing, what the traffic light's doing, and most importantly, what it's going to be doing. And uh, so that's, uh, that's quite, quite neat. And I see we're going to be driving in a very, very modern vehicle here, uh, being a Tesla Model S P100D. So I have to make sure to tell Brian not to put his foot down, otherwise I'm going to break my neck. So please everyone, excuse me if uh, the internet isn't perfect on this, um, on this drive. Um, so what we're going to see, and what I'm going to do is just ask Jessica if you can see the phone or whether or not I should hold the phone over here for a better view of it. I can see it. Um, I think the icons will be big enough, but yeah, I think that's probably going to be better. All righty. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to drive out here in Alpharetta, Georgia, uh, where a number of these traffic uh, intersections have been equipped with both in the dash if this was a ford you'd see it in, in the dash connections god she says okay peter i are can you? see you now you guys are back but you guys were gone for a little bit um, okay all right there's, there's, a, there, there, well, there's, there's a little hole in the road there where uh, the connections it, are very good it changed from wi-fi to cellular so we're running over cellular now everyone apologize for that you you brian was just saying that uh you know this is the first signal here where we're showing information on the display and you can see now that it's telling us 40 plus seconds before the signal is going to change and so the interesting thing about that is so that that's a first example of signal phase and timing 
where um, the countdown timer is being transmitted from the traffic signal co controller into the vehicle, which allows all kinds of applications to happen. So for example, this was a gasoline car, you can turn off uh, the engine because you know that there's some time to go. When you see that the countdown timer is approaching zero and like now, get ready for green. The light, the speakers in the car tell you that the, that the lights are gonna change green and that allows you to restart the engine of the car before the light turns green. The idea of all of these applications, so these are all going to be done by the, um, by the automakers. But what we're seeing is there's a bunch of third party applications. There's a bunch of cell phone applications. And as we drive through all of these intersections, we'll, and we'll see uh, the, um, the status of the intersection ahead, as well as what the, what the phone is uh, and, and the display is doing. Red light. So that's a red light running along. It's, what it did is it told me that the car estimated that I was not going to pay attention. As it happened, I gave Peter a bit of a fright here because I just drove a little bit aggressively and pretended that I wasn't going to stop. But, and so the car said, well, guys, you know, this was an audible alarm. And so that's the first kind of alarm. Here you can see faithfully reproducing a green straight and a um, red left turn. Um, so this, this is the combination of uh, the technology is map and spat. I'm just going to turn left up this road over here. I've got something else that's interesting up in this little circuit. Uh, and what it does is it knows which uh, traffic light you're approaching. You can see the name of the intersection. But in addition, that what we're doing here is we're saying, ah, did any of you notice that there was actually a school beacon that was on behind us? Well, as it happened, there wasn't. This is a, a test school beacon. But what it shows speeding in school zone is that I wasn't paying attention. I either missed the school beacon and I didn't slow down like I should have slowed down. And so that's the kind of safety application which is now put into the car. And the question is, should the car slow down by itself or should you be alerted? This is a verbal alert, should it shake your seat, should it shake the steering wheel? Those are all things that the automakers are working, working on. And we're showing that the, 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 the infrastructure is now ready to support that. Now, this is an interesting traffic light because it shows that there's more than 40 seconds before this light changes green. Now, as it happens, there's um, not so much cross traffic, whether it should service me and let me go more early. That's beside the point. That's for the, the traffic department uh, to figure out. But what we're doing is telling the, the driver that there's more than 20 seconds left before this light changes uh, to green. And so I'll put my indica indicator on. Now, this is the typically the kind of thing is in, in Russia where you don't pay attention and all, you're waiting for somebody to honk behind you. Get ready for green. But not anymore, because now the car tells you that the light's going to change green. You pay attention. And if we change, if we increase the pull-off time, the, the, reduce the startup delay, we can save, we can create another 5 to 10% capacity in the road network. This is an interesting intersection we're approaching because it's around the corner. And as it happens, just going red. So a future autonomous vehicle, this is the kind of thing that it needs to know around the corner so that we can uh, uh, properly alert folks that there's a danger of stopped vehicles and a stopped intersection around the corner. There's, uh, oh, there's an interesting thing ahead here. And what that is, is a flashing yellow arrow. Now, what is an autonomous vehicle on the left here? There's a flashing yellow arrow, which we put on the display like this. Now, what should the autonomous vehicle do with a flashing yellow arrow? 
Well, that's something for the auto companies to figure out and the autonomous vehicle companies to, to, to figure out. Um, and so just this little drive gives you a sense about the variability of the number of different types of traffic intersections. And we're going to do a, uh, a U-turn and then go back to one of the traffic cabinets and, uh, and have a look. So um, inside the traffic cabinet and have a look at the, at the radios and so forth. So you can see that this discussion that I've had here is much more about um, the applications than the, the radios or the messages and, and, and so forth. It just shows that the infrastructure is ready for prime time to deliver applications at the moment. And these are the kind of applications that the, that the auto companies are now busy working on uh, to bring to, to fruition. And um, that, hence the Infrastructure Automotive Technology Laboratory, because, um, so we might see some, diff some different things on this. Uh, yeah, like, yeah, it doesn't tell me any time now, Brian. Why, why would that be? Well, that's an interesting thing, but it will now. And the reason being is this on this particular traffic controller, it doesn't give uh, signal phase and timing information on that phase until it detects a vehicle on this loop. So there's a number of peculiarities in the, in the traffic signal controllers that need to be rung out. And the only way to ring them out is to drive around like this and see what, see what actually happens. Hey, Brian and Peter, I have a question here. Uh, someone's asking, what app are you using on your phone? Okay, so this is the Travel Safely app. And so this is a, a free download from the App Store. And it connects to these traffic intersections. We've got a number of cities that connect and work like this. And there's even a, a website which tells you uh, where, where it actually works. So this is our technology that we put out into the market to say, okay, we'll go first with applications. And this application works over um, the, the, the cell network, but it also works over cellular V2X and it also works over DSRC. For cellular V2X and DSRC, you need a translator in the vehicle. And the reason why you need a translator is because the phones don't support uh, the, you know, the, the direct radios at the moment. Uh, the expectation is that that they will in the future. So this is what we call a bridging technology, bridging the past to the present. And you can see here that it's just, we've still got a minute, so I can actually put the car into hold and, and confidently talk for a minute because I know that, um, that it's going to be at least that time uh, before the lights change uh, to green. And um, so, so this, this app supports Oh, about 30 different applications from pedestrians in crosswalks to cyclists to pedestrians to uh, emergency vehicles. Uh, I'll touch on emergency vehicles. All of these traffic intersections are equipped with emergency vehicle preemption. We're not going to show that today, but we thought of showing that in a, in a subsequent um, a podcast because it's a really a topic by itself, just how magic it is to drive around in a fire track and see all these lights change to green and everybody else brought safely to a halt. That's, a, that's one of the coolest connected vehicle applications. And then we can also see what happens when you in your car see, get bop, bop, emergency. Get ready for green. Hold on. The light's going to change. There it changes. You can see I was distracted. I was talking. And this application told uh, me that the light was going to change and get ready to go. Stop talking. Uh, and I went. Um, we're going to go to uh, the traffic cabinet uh, further up here, which is a place that we can park. We'll have a look and, and see whether we see any difference uh, on the traffic lights uh, on our way to this uh, application. Every time I do this, this little circuit, it's, there's a different thing that happens because uh, the, the traffic's always different. Uh, I saw another question there, uh, Jessica, from, uh, I think I saw... Red line. From, from Daryl Thomas. Uh, what, what was the question there? Get ready for green. 
Is Here there technology available now to advise the driver that a vehicle is about to jump the red signal along the side street at the upcoming signal? How would the technology in your car deal with that situation? Yes, that's called uh, collision avoidance. And so that is one of the apps. And what it does is it measures the velocity of uh, the, the approaching vehicle. Now, in the fullness of time, all vehicles are connected. But what we do, and this is again an advanced topic, where we can use virtualization to use a detector like a radar detector to see approaching vehicles and then broadcast those messages to make it safe for everybody else. So, yep, we've, there's, there's a lot of applications that are available now. Some of them require connected vehicles in all the, in all the vehicles. But before we get to that point, we can use the infrastructure detection to virtualize the vehicles to make them transmit uh, basic safety messages and messages. So we can do all the applications even when the emergency vehicle, uh, sorry, when the, all the vehicles are not equipped. Uh, I think I've just got to go in here. And this is where we're going to go and have a look at a, at a traffic cabinet and see what it looks like. Jessica, how are we doing for time here? I've been rambling around. You're doing, doing good. You're at 326. All right. And thank you, Brian, for not killing me. <laughs> Did have a few red light running there. Fortunately, travel safely kept you safe, Pete. All right, now we've got Walt, who's joining us, who is going to go and uh, show us into one of these cabinets. Walt, can you explain to us what, what we're going to see in these cabinets? Uh, you'll see where the, uh, the OE5 unit is mounted and how we connect to the uh, preempt infrastructure and also where the, uh, you'll be able to see the O95. All right, so what we're going to see is the O85 uh, that's in the cabinet. And for anyone that hasn't seen a traffic cabinet, this is a traffic cabinet, the big silver box on the side of the road that looks like a refrigerator. Um, and you're going to see at the outside of the box, first of all, there are a couple of antenna. This is a, a cellular and GPS antenna. And this is a 900 megahertz antenna that's used for talking to emergency vehicles. And if we look way up on the pole over there, you'll see there's a cabinet box and you'll see the antenna up there. So and, what are, what are, and, and I'm going to point over to Brian because he knows this stuff better than anyone else. Right. So what I'm going to use, instead of the applied information part numbers, which uh, our distributors are, are used to, I'm going to use you know, the other terminology which is used in the connected vehicle space. So what you're seeing on the, on the pole on the right-hand side here is called an RSU. This is an RSU uh, that complies with all the national standards like the USDOT's 4.1 standard, uh, it complies with the NEMA TS-10 standard, and so forth. And what you're seeing over here is a, uh, this is called a split RSU, where the antenna is not located with the radios. The black box over here is where the radios are. The antenna over there have got no electronics in them at all. They're just radio antennas. The reason why this was done like this is so that you can maintain the radios without having a bucket truck. They're carefully selected to be seven feet off the ground, so that you, this one's I think at eight feet, so that you can maintain this from a ladder. And that is hugely important in our view in the, the practical deployment of connected vehicles, because what you end up with then is the ability to maintain these uh, devices in inner cities where to get a, 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 on, a, on this master with a bucket truck is just, is just involves a lane closure. In the event of a lane closure, you're making the traffic worse, not better, you're putting people's lives at risk. We came up with the idea that that's a better idea to be able to 
separate the antenna from the radio. The other key thing that the, this gives us and, and this approach is the uh, business of upgradable radios. So these radio uh, enclosures, the RSUs, include DSRC radios and cellular V2X radios. The reason why they include both is that in this way, you don't have to decide which radio you're going to support. You can support both the radios. The actual cost of the radios is not really significant. It's the cost of, of putting them up and everything else that, uh, that costs the money. So we're able to, um, and they're both broadcast the same spat and the same map files. So there's no increased uh, cost of commissioning or, or configuration or anything like that. The other key thing that this approach does is it gives you a third slot. Now these are pluggable radios, uh, probably in, in some other radio masterclass we might consider exactly what all the radios look like and how they work and how the pluggable idea, but, but essentially it's just a, a plug uh, that the radio plugs into uh, in, in, the, in the RSU. And what happens then in the third slot, we have a slot for a future radio. So the future radio might be advanced DSRC, it might be um, 5G NR, it might be 5G um, release 16 or 17, whatever th th that release is. It might be 6G. And the point of this is that no matter what the FCC does, and no matter what um, the, the, you know, the, the industry ad adopts or the auto companies start, this infrastructure is future-proof and, and it's maintainable and it's future-proof. We'll have a look in the, in the traffic cabinet here. Uh, and this is just uh, the devices that, uh, you know, we're, and this is for those good, for folks who want to see what a traffic cabinet, the detector cards and power supply and the load switches and so forth, the, the conflict monitor. This is a typical US traffic uh, cabinet. I, um, I know there's some folks from overseas, Daryl, hi to you in South Africa. Um, what, what you see over here is what we call an RSU processor. So uh, it's an RSU peak. The reason why the, the, this, this is an RSU processor is split away from the RSU is when you're doing applications like transit signal priority and preemption, you really want to have the unit in the cabinet for testing and diagnostic purposes. What this dial over here does is it simulates a input from a connected uh, emergency vehicle. And so you can test that the functionality of the traffic controller behaves right. Now the actual traffic controller itself is uh, this unit, this 2070 LC unit at the bottom uh, below here. And what that does is that actually turns the traffic lights regular and green. But this approach of combining um, or having the RSU processor that does the preempt uh, and the uh, transit signal priority, as well as the cabinet monitoring in the cabinet leads for a much more effective solution because you're not trying to do your commissioning or turning these dials or, or sitting with a laptop uh, up at the up at the top of a pole, so uh, and you can see that this is live with a heartbeat uh, and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Let's take 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 a walk around the back of it, just so someone can actually see, you know, what's at the back of a cabinet. A lot of people haven't looked inside of these cabinets, Brian, and there's obviously a lot of equipment in here. This is the connection coming up from underground from the RSU, and it just goes into one of the switch ports here and our RSU processors connected to the other port. In this location, we're able to connect to the net two port on the controller so that we don't have to interfere with the city's fiber backbone network. We can operate independently, talk directly to the controller. So there's obviously a lot of different things in here. They fiber switches, they conflict monitors, our device at the back there where we've got preemption outputs also going directly into the cabinet to be wired in, there's a, a, a tempo harness on the back here, and there's a lot of different cables that are plugged in here. Now, Walt can, or, or Brian, can you explain to me why would you need to wire in something like 
AC power and cabinet flash? The, the reason being is that as we've got thousands and thousands of devices out there, connected vehicle devices of all sorts, the most, the single biggest cause of lack of reliability of your traffic operations is the quality of the power. And so what you wanted to be able to do is to be able to A, send back to the traffic management center and B, to the connected vehicle world to say if the power has failed or the power is unstable or there's a brownout and so forth, that this, uh, this traffic cabinet is busy failing. Now that's something that some cabinets have battery backups and the battery backups in turn need to be monitored. But what we do here is, uh, is have a, a very effective uh, power and flash monitoring connected directly to the flash transfer relay and the AC power supply, which tells us exactly what's going on in the cabinet. Uh, and then uh, the RSU processor has a battery in it, uh, which enables it to continue. So for example, if it can no longer send that signal out over the fiber, because the fiber switch is dead, what it'll do, it'll send that over the cellular network back to Glance, the central monitoring system, where it'll create an alert and tell the maintenance folks, hey, the power's failed at, 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 at this location, at Georgia Lane and at, uh, one, at, and at North Point Parkway. And, and, and any kind of other things that, uh, that we monitor, Walt, in, in, in a cabinet? I mean, what, what else are we trying to monitor in a cabinet? Well, we monitor battery backup unit voltages if there is one. We manage it, manage, uh, monitor like uh, like you said. We do the flash transfer relay whether the cabinet's in stop time, which might mean that it's being manually operated. Um, temperature, uh, humidity, just any environmental conditions to let us know if there's a problem. There's there. actually a very important one right over here. Oh yeah, the door switch. Because these are the door switches. So in fact, what we do this create an alarm uh, in the local traffic management center. So before we came out here, we knew we were coming to this particular cabinet. And so what uh, Walt did is he notified the cabinet, uh, notified the traffic operations center to say, hey guys, expect a door open alarm. We're going to go and uh, show the world what a, an Alpharetta traffic cabinet looks like. Now, now some people might say, uh, well, you know, connected vehicles, RSU radios, you know, no one really does any of this monitoring aspect behind it. Why do you need to monitor anything? Well, this is what the future looks like that we haven't really experienced so far. In 2022, uh, Ford's going to put vehicles on the road with connected vehicle applications and connected vehicle radios that are going to depend on this technology all working. Now, this is for the first time that us in surface transportation are going to be subject to the auto companies interfacing with the traffic signal, not just with your eyes, but as you saw, with your ears and through your brake pedal. And so we're going to be exposed to a much higher uh, level of service requirement. And so that's why it's absolutely critical to monitor everything so we can make sure this technology is available for the cars that quite quickly, every guard body is going to be dependent on them and used to having them work. That's the one reason. The other reason is that uh, the emergency vehicle, which also used this connected vehicle technology to get more quickly through the traffic and through traffic lights, literally lives depend on, on it. If you save a minute uh, in response time, which is a typical city response time saving, uh, which is a topic for another, uh, show how we, how we do that. What's um, that minute? results in statistically a significant better health outcome for the citizen who's in need. So that's why we've got to keep it all working. And that's why monitoring is so critical. Great. Um, just want to check in with Jessica. While we're out here, before we head back in the car, do we have any questions at the moment? Yeah, we have someone asking, is your RSU compliant with the US DOT's RSU 4.1 specification and or is it Omni-Air certified? And the answer to the first one is yes, it is compliant with the latest <coughs> uh, RSU 4.1 specification. Uh, and the 
interesting thing about Omnia certification, we're actually working with them uh, and, and other folks on the Omnia certification of the dual mode radio. Currently, the Omnia certification is only available for the DSRC side of the radio. And yes, our DSRC radio module has passed through uh, Omnia certification. So that's a lot, slightly more complicated than, than yes or no, but yes, it applies with RSU 4.1. And yes, the DSRC radio has passed Omnia certification. And yes, we will be getting Omnia certification on the dual mode, dual active radio, just as soon as Omnia um, and, and, and us and other partners uh, have that certification ready. Expected later on this year, by the way. Can you explain what you mean by dual mode, dual active? Right. So the dual mode is cellular V2X and DSRC. And so, as it happens, it's DSRC, cellular VTX, cellular VTN, and unlicensed radio. But let's put those radios on the side and focus on the, up at the top of the pole is the DSRC and cellular VTX radio. Now, there are a lot of folks in the uh, traffic business who have a very strong opinion whether uh, you should do one of those radios or the other. As it happens, we don't have a strong opinion. We think that the infrastructure should support all current and future radios. And so the dual mode radio means that it supports cellular V2X and DSRC. You don't have to choose the one or the other. You can choose both. The dual active means that they both work at the same time. Now, some folks said, well, it'll settle one way or the other. You've got... Uh, either DSRC or cellular V2X will win out. But that may or may not be the case. Uh, so for example, Ford is fully, this is public information, Ford is publicly committed to cellular V2X and Toyota is publicly committed to DSRC. Now those are huge multi-billion dollar companies and one may win or both may win. And you know, what should we in the surface infrastructure do. So what we say is that let's do both. And how we do both cellular VTX and DSRC, we ensure at the radio level uh, that we don't interfere with each other. And the reason how we do that is we send out the messages from this uh, traffic intersection, first one, then the other. So they're not being transmitted at the same time, even though the, the radios do uh, discriminate and pick up su succession. But that's how we can ensure that we don't have um, uh, confusion or cross bleed. Some of this depends what the FCC is going to decide and where they put the DSRC spectrum and the, and the CV2X spectrum. That's a more complicated topic for another, for another day. But the dual mode, dual active means when, I, when we talk to the cities, in this case, through our channel partners, Temple, who've been, who've been great in, in getting this installation stood up. When they talk to the cities, they can say to the city with 100% confidence, don't worry, we've got the future for you. You don't have to worry about deciding between one thing or other thing. We've got the future and it's glorious. Jessica, you want to ask another question? I do. Okay, so I have some travel um, safely questions. Um, one is, does the app show pedestrian timing? And the answer is yes. Uh, it, um, it, it shows pedestrian timing and countdown timing. And it also shows, uh, we've interfaced it with uh, some video detection guys. So when there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk, it'll actually show um, that, give a pedestrian warning to say, there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk, either ahead, in the, in the far side or actually on the adjacent crosswalk. So this is, you know, one of the 30 applications uh, or so that we support. And if you want to see what the, the, all these applications are, just go to the App Store or the Google Play Store, download Travel Safely, uh, and you'll see it's called Glance Travel Safely. And what you'll do is under settings, you'll see all the applications that we, that we do. And so what this does is it demonstrates that you can do uh, applications with the radios that are already in your phone. 
Now that makes me sound like I'm selling one radio over the other radio. That's not the case at all. You can do this radio in the upcoming Fords, which are going to have uh, uh, new, new kinds of radios. You can do it um, with, in Fords with Ford Sync, which uses the radios in your phone. What this is actually demonstrating is sort of that the radios are not a critical part of the piece, provided you don't select one and not the other. If you select all the radios, then you, then you can focus on applications like pedestrian crossing applications, like collision avoidance, um, like rear end collisions and so forth. And you can focus on all these applications <coughs> while the FCC and the auto companies are sorting out which radio they want to use. All right, Brian, there are a couple more questions, but what I suggest is let's uh, walk towards the car right. so that people can see us driving back uh, and experience some of it while you ask the rest of the questions. Yeah, let's do, let's do that. Be uh, good. Walt, thank you very much for showing us the, the cabinets. Really appreciate it. And thanks very much to the city of Alpharetta. All right, Emily, um, no, uh, Jessica, can you, can you shout out the next question? Yes. So um, what someone is asking, what kind of info should be entered into the Travel Safely app by the user? Example, can I indicate if I'm riding a bike, car, et cetera? Uh, yes, and the answer is yes, but you don't have to. And the reason being is that by default, uh, the Travel Safely app will use your motion, your speed uh, over a period to, to try and determine what you are, whether you a, so for example, I'll, I don't know whether it's outside where you can see, but travel safety is showing that I'm a pedestrian because it's detected I'm walking around. And now it will actually trigger and show you the pedestrian applications. When we get into the car and start moving, it'll change over to the fact that I'm a motorist. So uh, you don't have to uh, you know, manually enter that, but if you do manually enter it, it will override what is currently there. And so, uh, and again, the travel safety app is once the, uh, uh, the, the phone is stationary, it'll detect that for a few minutes and then come out with, uh, it will turn the, turn the, you know, the transmitters off uh, so that you, uh, you save the battery in the phone. Uh, what this also does is it runs in the background of the phone so that you can uh, check your text or do any other things that you might choose to, uh, and then the, uh, the, the, the voice commands will come up in the background. All right, let's head back to the, the idea. All right, nice and quiet again, Jessica. Um, do you want to go ahead and um, ask the next question? Yeah, so this one is, is about um, fright. Uh, so it's a little off topic, um, but I'll go ahead and ask it. And if we, we don't have enough time to answer it, we can um, reach out directly. But Someone is asking, is this technology available to be used for present day freight trucks to let them know about a railroad crossing being blocked? If achievable, what kind of hardware would be necessary for the trucks? And the answer is yes. And so what uh, we do is um, uh, we've done that in a number of uh, locations. The first instance with, uh, with railroad crossings is that you can put up signs which show uh, the status of the railroad crossing. And a number of folks have done that with this connected vehicle technology is to show that, uh, that the railroads crossed ahead. You can also use this with the Travel Safely app and uh, use that to, uh, um, to show the status of the railroad crossing ahead. Uh, and we also uh, are talking to a number of folks about doing some freight priority with um, using your phone as a, a method of doing transit signal, a transit signal priority like thing for freight vehicles. So the answer is yes, that you can connect to the, um, uh, the traffic controller or the gate 
crossing for the railroad crossing, uh, get that input, and then broadcast that out either by travel safety on phones or you can point broadcast it by uh, by putting up signs, blank out signs, which say um, the uh, and and we've deployed that in um, Boston area, and we've also deployed it into. Um, uh, Boston and uh, where is it? Um, uh, Arlington, Texas, and uh, Georgia. Hey, you want to just take over? Oh, the phone? Sorry. So yeah. And um, someone is asking: Is the app available for all types of phones? And the answer is yes. Well, no, actually, let me be precise. I'm a technology guy. The answer is no. It actually is available for iOS and available for Android. We didn't actually do for Windows Phone on account of the fact nobody uses that anymore. And we didn't do BlackBerry either on account of the fact nobody uses that. I'm sort of making a joke that yes, it's worth, it's available for iOS and Android. Okay, is um, Travel Safely uh, capable of doing overheight vehicle warnings? Yes, it is. Uh, we, we haven't, uh, we've done a number of overheight vehicle warnings, but um, uh, haven't, uh, just gonna yeah. put, put the phone back there while we, uh, while we drive back to the IATL. And so uh, the overheight warnings, yes, uh, that would be uh, an application, but again, generally what's happened with overheight warnings is that, um, uh, we do it with signs that uh, say that where there's an overheight, um, you know, a violation has occurred. So at the IATL, you will also see uh, the actual physical signs that are in the, uh, you know, for the railroad crossings and things like that. Um, depending on how much time we have left, we can show you those couple of things. How are we, how are we doing for time, Jessica? You've got eight minutes. <laughs> All right, we'll walk inside. We'll answer one or two more questions and then uh, probably call it today. Sounds great. Are we, are we missing any questions at the moment, Miss Jessica? No, nope, we have uh, someone that's asked how many downloads we've had so far on the app. Uh, this, I think it's just under 10,000, somewhere around there, around 10,000 people have downloaded the app and using it. And that's, I don't know if that's the actual downloads, that's kind of active users uh, of, of the application. And obviously, there are multiple different cities. It's more popular uh, where cities have deployed, you know, all the infrastructure. And also, there's been almost zero advertising as well. So there hasn't, there hasn't been anyone advertising this. And as you go and do more and more advertising, obviously uh, there are more and more people that actually download these things. So you can see this is what the IATL looks like from the outside as we come in. And uh, maybe we wanna walk up and have a look at the, the, um, the freight application, I mean, not freight, railroad crossing that we can actually show you um, kind of the, the information that you could give to uh, drivers, um, especially the freight vehicles, that there's actually a railroad active ahead. And um, if I walk down here, this is one of the railroad warning beacons. And if I flip it on, you'll actually see this is what was deployed in Boston where it says Front Street Railroad Crossing in use, seek an alternate route. At the same time that this is flashing, there's also messages that are received in the vehicles. Correct. So this, uh, this would uh, come up and travel safely. So that again, that this is, uh, that you're interfacing with this railroad crossing, not only with your eyes, but with your ears. And so for in fact, I was driving through Alpharetta this morning and a fire truck uh, was approaching me with its lights and sirens on uh, in the opposite uh, direction. And my phone went bop, bop, 
emergency vehicle front. So a connected vehicle application there was to tell me through my ears that the emergency vehicle was approaching me from the front. Because you know what it's like when an emergency vehicle is approaching you and it goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You go, whoa, whoa, I wonder where it's coming from. Now your phone or your car tells you that it's approaching you from the front or the right, the left or from behind. Any more questions there, Jessica? Nope, we had, we had someone ask if all AI employees drive Teslas, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the answer is yes and no, no, uh, not, not all uh, AI employees drive Teslas, but uh, we, we do have 10 of them. And the reason being is that our public facing guys who are demonstrating uh, the technology to the marketplace, we want everybody to live and experience autonomous electric and connected vehicles and so that's why we uh, we, we live it so that uh, we can you know use our technology with their technology uh, to demonstrate what this better future of connected vehicles is that we're talking about and what have you learned from there that you've implemented in your company's technology well there was actually an early on a very important lesson that I learned when I first bought a Tesla uh, it was just after the very unfortunate incident in Florida where somebody was killed while on autopilot. And the number of people who told me, oh, Brian, you've got to be careful, man. That thing is going to kill you. And what it was is that car went underneath a truck uh, and unfortunately killed the, the driver. And so, you know, I said, no, no, I've got this. But three weeks after I got the vehicle, Tesla did an over-the-air software update of the software in the vehicle, including changing the drivers for the, the uh, radars and very, very complicated stuff to fix that problem, to make sure the car learned from that accident and it would never happen again. And that's brought it home to me how all the software that we deploy in these 20,000 devices and 500 cities are all updatable remotely. And so that was the big lesson that I learned, that all our technology includes over there software updates so that what we can do is fix problems and create new features, download them into the devices so that the customer can always be assured of having the latest technology and, the, and how that applies to connected vehicles. There might be some uncertainty about the map file or the SPAT file or the, 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 the standards or what the frequencies are. These are all the software driven radios and so what we have is the confidence because everything we do supports over there software update that we can fix anything and pro provide an absolutely secure future that our customers can buy into that it's all future proof perfect well thank you brian uh right. that's 358 you saved everyone two minutes of their life um, I hope not everyone got car sick driving around with us, but we really appreciate you all joining us and uh, learning from, from Brian, who's got this extensive knowledge on, uh, on connected vehicles. And um, Jessica, what is next week's uh, session that we're doing? So we will be coming to you again on Tuesday, same time, 3 Eastern. I will send out the invite again. Um, but if you don't get our invitations, then make sure you contact training at appinfoinc.com. Next week, we're talking about additional solutions that applied information does, such as railroad crossings, flood warning, overheight detection, some of the things y'all asked about um, today. So we'll be addressing um, additional solutions in next week's webinar. All right, fantastic. Thanks, everybody.